Now, looking at the life of faith of uh, some of the women in the Bible, I want to look back this evening at the life of Esther for a few moments uh, this evening. It's an interesting book, Esther. You probably know it's the only book in the Bible that God isn't mentioned explicitly. Uh, but I think that's very important uh, because it's a picture of life under God, even though God isn't mentioned explicitly. We see very clearly God's hand in this book. It's crystal clear. And uh, it's an encouragement for us to act as Christians because He is acting as God, even though we can't see that. And this is a book that helps us in that respect because it's not explicitly God mentioning. Uh, it doesn't give us, and really, it doesn't really give us the picture from God's point of view, which the Bible usually does. It kind of is giving us a picture, as it were, under the sun of uh, lives of faith that are touched by God and that are under God and that are relying on God, but unspoken. It's a very interesting concept. But yet we have in this book a reminder of the importance of acting for God, even when it seems impossible, and also because God is sovereign and because God is acting. So we've got that great paradox of Scripture, which is absolutely true, that God is sovereign We've been looking at that in Hebrews in the morning all the time. God is sovereign over all of life. But that doesn't mean that we're puppets. And it doesn't mean we have no responsibility. And it doesn't mean that we're not called to obedience. And that's really in many ways what Esther is about. It's written uh, later on in the Old Testament history, probably about a hundred years after the Jewish people who had been in the Promised Land but had turned to idolatry and uh, were taken into captivity by ba the Babylonians. They were taken from their own country, to, ripped out of Jerusalem. They were taken into slavery and to, uh, taken into captivity in Babylon. And then after about 70 years, and a lot of the old minor prophets speak about this in the Old Testament, after about 70 years, they began, to, well, at least a remnant of them began to filter back in Nehemiah's time uh, to rebuild the, their life in uh, Jerusalem and Judea. But many of them didn't go back. There was a diaspora spread throughout the whole of Persia. A lot of Jewish people didn't go back home. They stayed where they'd been for maybe seven, you know, a couple of generations. But like the highland diaspora to the cities and over the middle of last century, a lot of people moved from the highlands and still do and settle in, in the central belt or down in England. Uh, or, or throughout the world. And uh, we see it all the time. Well, that's what was happening here. And uh, in this story, uh, Esther uh, is a, a young Jewish girl. And when we get to where we are, she's become the queen in this massive Persian empire uh, under King Xerxes. Now, can I just briefly uh, introduce that story? And uh, you're not going to sleep. It's a good story, and it's an interesting story. Uh, but there's, there's, in the first kind of, up to the first four chapters or so, where we come to Esther becoming queen, uh, there's at least three strands going on. It's like, you know, sometimes you watch a film, and it jumps. There's, there's one main theme, but there's maybe three subplots going on. You, you go there, and there's, there's one main character, but then there's a, a secondary character, and he's got a subplot, and then you move to a third character, and there's something else happening there, and it's all going to come together. Well, there's kind of three, at least three strands in this uh, early chapters of Esther. Esther, uh, very, very quickly, uh, Esther's story is that she's an orphaned Jewish girl. Okay, her mother and father are no longer living, and she's been brought up by her uncle-cousin type guy, Mordecai. Okay, he's looked after her. And he's become some kind of counselor or political person within uh, King Xerxes' uh, 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 lordship, ruler, 
thiefdom uh, in the city. And uh, he's, at various points, quite significant in the story. But before all that happens, um, this king in chapter 1, if you've got time to read it, go home and read it. It's a great story. This king, King uh, Erxes, is a hugely, hugely rich and and, uh, powerful king, most powerful man in the world at the time. And uh, he wants to show all the surrounding uh, vassal states and uh, vassal leaders his wealth and his honor and uh, have a big party. And they have a, a tremendous kind of celebration, and the most opulent kind of celebration you could imagine. And uh, it describes one or two of the things. It even describes that they've all, everyone who's there is given their own individual gold cup. And they're given their individual kind of waiter to pour as much wine as they're used to. So, you know, you could go there and have just some time at his party with the best of wine and uh, being poured out just uh, just exactly as you like it, as often as you liked it. And as this party went on and King Erxes was kind of maybe getting, maybe had a little bit too much to drink over that period, he wanted his queen to come in. And he wanted her to be shown off to all the other uh, p- political leaders. Just come in, Queen Vashti, he said. And uh, just parade in front of all these people because I want to show you off. You know, kind of thing happened. has happened in another story in the Bible, not, not dissimilar to that in many ways. But she refused. And no chance. I'm not going to have all these drunken guys and showing off my beauty to them. So he deposed her. She said, I'm sorry, you can't disobey the king. You're deposed. We don't hear of Vashti ever again. And so he decides he wants another queen. And he pulls together all the most beautiful women in the, the, really in the whole area, and, and that includes Esther, beautiful young Jewish woman. And as things go on, uh, it gets narrowed down, and it gets narrowed down, and narrowed down. And Esther is chosen. Six months preparation for skin treatment, six months for uh, dietary concerns. So she comes to the king one year later as the new queen. She is chosen. This orphaned Jewish girl, she doesn't tell of her Jewish background. She doesn't, well, we presume she doesn't say much about Mordecai, either her cousin That's one strand. There's another strand is one of the leaders in uh, King Erxes' uh, parliament or government is a guy called Haman. And um, Haman gets promoted at one point. And it's such a promotion that the king's decree and command is that everyone should bow down when they see him. He was important, second only to the king. But Mordecai, remember, the uncle, cousin kind of bloke, he would not at any point bow down to Haman, and Haman hated him for that. Now, there's a hint there of Mordecai's faith. Even though he was exiled, even though he was uh, part of the diaspora and he hadn't gone back to Jerusalem, he knew that there was one living God, and he didn't worship and bow down to any human being, let alone Haman. Maybe they were political rivals. Maybe there was uh, something going on there. We're, we're not told a great deal, but he, he was outraged that Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Found out that Mordecai was from the Jewish people, so he went to the king and said to the king, I want uh, you to give me a decree so that I can annihilate the strange people with strange customs who live all throughout your kingdom, get rid of all of them of whom Haman is one. He didn't just want rid of Haman, he wanted rid of the whole lot, every Jew. Ethnic cleansing by royal decree. That's the second strand in this, these early chapters that lead us up to chapter 4. The third is there's a spiritual strand going on. You remember from Genesis chapter 3 that uh, God had promised from the seed of the woman, the seed of Eve would come a Savior who would crush the serpent's head. And from that moment on, the serpent, Satan, made every effort to destroy Eve's seed, God's people in the Old Testament. 
whether it be in Egypt or whether it be through the Amalekites or whether it be through uh, uh, various ways that they would be destroyed. And this was another attempt of Satan to destroy the people of God. So there's kind of, there's different levels, there's layers going on there. And that brings us to the point where Esther, as queen, is challenged by her uncle Mordecai, her uncle cousin Mordecai, I can never quite remember what it is in the story, uh, to act and to use the position God has brought her to. You come to the kingdom, he says uh, in this uh, section, you've come to the kingdom for such a, you know, it's a famous uh, text in the Bible, who knows, but you've come to royal position for such a time as this. The, the subtext is that look, you've been brought here. This has not happened by chance. You can influence this situation. God will use you. You need to remember God has placed you here. And that's the challenge uh, that we come to in this story. And th there's a subtext of faith uh, r running through Esther. And it's one for us that we can see with our knowledge of the rest of Scripture, one being that God is working through all of life's circumstances. God is working to bring Esther to this place. She maybe doesn't know it. She maybe has no idea up to this point what's been happening in her life. Maybe she's just like, hey, I've got lucky here. I'm just an orphan Jewish girl, and now I'm the queen, and I can do, and I can say, and I have whatever I want. And maybe she didn't see God's hand in that. But God is working to bring her to this position for a specific spiritual purpose. Even when Satan is working, even in darkness, even in evil, even what Satan seeks to do to destroy our lives, we find that God is a purpose and God is sovereign and is responsible uh, and sovereign over these things. And we have a responsibility to act as believers in an obedient and in a wise way. And he always has, we can see here, and always has a higher purpose through faith. So, we've got a situation which is a desperate human situation. Now, God could have at any point come and uh, zapped Haman, couldn't he? He could have just got rid of him. He chose not to because he recognizes that, that there's this mystery between God's sovereignty and our responsibility, that we are co-workers in the kingdom. And uh, Esther is an example of that. She becomes a co-worker of God, God's kingdom and God's kingdom progressing. We are servants of living God in His kingdom. And uh, you may feel this evening that your life is directionless as a Christian. You may feel the events of the last week or the events of the last month or the last year appear to have absolutely no purpose and meaning. They may be random to you. You may feel old and unused or just a pretty face with no other gifts and talents. You may feel unnoticed, unloved, unvalued in the Christian community. You feel your work is mundane. Your circumstances are inexplicable. Wait on God. Your life is blessed by being a co-worker to develop and to grow God's kingdom. It may sometimes not be clear, but you have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility to live by faith and to live by the truth and to live in obedience and see where that will take us. We see that working out. We'll see that as we quickly go through uh, Esther. Because we see uh, not just the kind of um, uh, her becoming queen, and what that means. But then we see her faced with this great faith challenge, okay? In this chapter that we're reading, she's, she's in this position of privilege, and Mordecai says to her, you have to act. I think this would be a great film. I'd love to watch. Is it a film, Esther? I don't know. It would be a great Hollywood film. Anyway, Esther faced a great challenge. She's in a position of privilege, and she's been asked to go into the king's presence. Now, remember, Queen Vashti said no to the king, and she was deposed. It wasn't a good thing. You could just die for going into the king's presence. It wasn't, it wasn't like what it is for us today, going into the queen or anyone's significance presence. Uh, it was, these were different and difficult days. And she, she recoils a little bit where Mordecai says, look, you've got to do this. 
You've got to go and, and beg for your, your people and beg for their lives. And she says, well, look, you know, uh, no one approaches the king. If you do, you get killed if you're not asked. And even sometimes, absolutely, if you do get into his presence and he puts out the golden scepter, you might get an opportunity to be heard. But I've not been asked to go and see the king for 30 days, she says. It's not looking good. And she kind of is slightly reluctant. Understandably, she hesitated. But then Esther, uh, Mordecai comes back to her and says, look, do you think you're going to escape just because you're the queen? Do you think your people don't depend on you? And that you have, uh, you have this position where you need to act or you will perish. God's will will be done, amazingly, he says here. But you have been brought to the kingdom, and God is wanting to use you to do his work. And that's a great challenge. And we have Esther's beautiful response, don't we? That she tells the people to go and fast for three days. Again, doesn't say she's going to fast and pray, but we presume they didn't just fast for the sake of it. They fasted for a spiritual reason, and they fasted to, to find out God's will and to uh, implore God. And she asked all the people to fast. She says, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. That's her statement. That's her testimony of obedience and of faith at this time. Uh, Esther made the choice to put herself in God's hand to call the people and herself to prayer to stand up and be counted whatever the consequences. She was going to stand up for the truth, stand up for her people, stand up for God's work uh, among their, uh, their, her, her people, and if she died, if she perished, she perished. She believed she was in God's hands. She obeyed whatever the circumstances. And there's, a, there's kind of simple challenges for us in that also, is there not? That uh, uh, we have to recognize that God is working in our lives, that we are part of His kingdom, and He wants to use us to further His kingdom. So it might not be as dramatic as Esther, but uh, God has many crossroads for us. Uh, you might say there's one great crossroad in life. Do you obey or do you disobey? But I think probably every day there's crossroads of faith that we have to decide are we going to be Christians who recognize, see with the eye of faith, even though God isn't that visible, just as He's not that visible in the story, but with the eye of faith He is clearly visible. Are we going to look with the eye of faith and be challenged to make the right faith choices in our life every day? Follow God and leave the consequences to Him. Sometimes we don't know what the consequences are. Sometimes it's very hard to do the right thing. I'm, and again, I'm not, this might not be like Esther. It might just be in everyday little things, but we're asked in the kingdom to uh, be used by God and to make the right decisions for God. Pray and do what's right. There's many times as a Christian we're reluctant to do the faith thing. It might seem impossible like it seemed for Esther. But are we going to stand up and be counted for Jesus Christ? Or are we going to just be interested in our own selves and our own uh, security and safety? There are many faith junctions. And it's important that you pray for wisdom and then do what's right. Whatever it might be in your life. Now, there are many, maybe many people just now who are at a faith junction. Maybe it's starting university. You've left home. You're freed from the shackles of your oppressive Christian parents. And you can, you can let go. And you can fly. Or you can follow Jesus Christ. Or it may be in your job that you're at crossroads of faith where you've been asked to compromise your faith or do what's right and leave the consequences to God. Although there might be fear and a sense of impossibility there, it might be in your church life, it might be in your marriage, it might be in many different ordinary things. 
And God may be saying to you tonight, who knows, but you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. To serve him, to witness for him, to share your faith in a way that is standing up for his truth and for his honor. And I also think that even within the church context, I think it's fair to say, I think we're living in fairly unique days and uh, you're part of this church and I want you to be part of this church. But more importantly than that, I think God wants you to be part of this church. And uh, for you to think that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this in this church with this community of believers to serve Christ in this place, to use your knowledge of the friends that you have and the contacts that you make for His glory in this community, that you've come to the kingdom to share your faith for these days and for this time. Are we going to be those who move forward in faith and do what's right tomorrow? Or are we going to shrink back and not be part of the kingdom work? It's really a great picture of a, an ordinary person being used by God to further a kingdom's work, God's kingdom work. And we are privileged to be part of God's kingdom work. And we're asked to play our role with all our uniqueness and with all our talents and with all our time and with all our unique friendships to recognize that we have, we have this spiritual dimension to our lives that isn't just about our career, our future, our happiness, our contentment, uh, our joy, but it's about belonging to this kingdom and seeing God's providential hand at work in our lives and trusting Him for that. Because it takes us to the, this reality of Esther seeing faith's results. And, and she does what she uh, prayerfully and fasting says she's going to do. She goes to the king. And there, when she does, when she, and this is the important, I think for me it's the important point of Esther. When she does what's right, all she does is go to the king. When she does what's right, we begin to see that God is working in ways far beyond her involvement. So, you see, she goes to the king, and the king previously has been unable to sleep, okay? And she's got no control or power over that. He can't sleep one night, so like any good ancient king, he gets out the, the books that tell about all his great uh, acts that he's done in the past and what's happened in his kingdom. It's great life, isn't it? You go and read about all the great things that people have written about you so you can get to sleep at night. So that's what he does. He gets out this big book and he finds out in this book that there was a plot to assassinate him. And two guys that were plotting on the city gate. And Mordecai, uncle, great uncle Mordecai, cousin Mordecai, he was the one that heard about it and told the king, or told, uh, it was passed on to the king, so that the assassination attempt was stopped. And uh, the king didn't realize this. He said, why is Mordecai not being given honor for this? And so he invites, who does he invite? He invites Haman, and the guy who wants to assassinate everyone, he invites Haman into the palace and says, Haman, what would you do for someone in the kingdom that really ought to be honored? And Haman thinks, yeah, it's me. It's obviously me. So he lists off all these great things that he would do uh, to the person who's going to be honored because he thought it was going to be him. And the king says, go and do that for Mordecai. Can you imagine Haman? <laughs> Can you imagine? Just his knees would knock together probably would just feel like collapsing. This hate, uh, Mordecai that he hated. All of a sudden, the king's going to honor him with what was due for me. And by the way, he had had, uh, his family had goaded him to build a gallows in his garden for Haman, for Mordecai to be hung on when the time came. 
So Esther invites Haman and the king for a meal. Kind of subsequent to that and in between that. And Haman thinks, I'm very honored. There's only me in the audience of the queen and the king. And then, of course, this happens in between, and then he goes back, and he's a bit worried by this point. And Esther exposes to the king that her life is in danger, and her people's life is in danger because of what this evil man Haman had done. And, of course, the king, the story goes on, and the king uh, recognizes uh, the evil perpetrator, and he ends up being hung on his own gallows, and uh, the enemies of the Jewish people are destroyed. And uh, the people celebrate, the Jews celebrate, and go on celebrating for years to come the day of their freedom, and the day of their salvation, and the day of their redemption, brought about by her act of obedience. It's above and beyond her involvement, isn't it? She, at one level, she's a kind of bit player, but there's lots of things happening here that God is sovereignly governing because He's in control, but yet He uses her. And we will find that again and again, that when we simply do the simple things, when we're challenged by the Word of God to act in faith, to do what we should do because we belong to the kingdom of God, to serve, to obey, uh, to do what's right, to pray, to watch, to serve, then God will use us and miracles will flow around about us in ways that we can never manipulate or, or manage ourselves. He will use our lives far more than we can imagine, just as He used Esther's life and made things happen around her obedience that she couldn't do anything about, but glorify God when she recognized and we will find that. You will find that when you do the simple things that God commands in your simple, ordinary life and in my simple, ordinary life, we will find that He is, he is breaking down walls, and He is changing people's minds, and He is keeping people from sleeping, and He is phoning, making people phone certain people at, this, at a certain time because we will see God's hand of miraculous hand of providence at work. And that's what it means to follow God and to live a life of faith and to be part of this uh, sovereign plan of His. And you know, His place, it's a safe place to be. You know, Haman made that clear. Um, sorry, Mordecai made that clear to uh, Esther. He said, look, you're not going to escape if you, if you deny what you're supposed to be doing here. And for us, it in Christ and in obedience. Can I say that? In the simple obedient things that you'll be asked and I'll be asked to do tomorrow. That's the safe place to be. I'm not saying, I can be completely contradictory and say it's a dangerous and a risky place to be, but it's safe. It's dangerous and risky because we'll be exposed to Satan's attacks and uh, to opposition in many different ways, but his times are in God's hands. And he is sovereign over these things. So it's the safest place to be. The walk of faith is the safest walk to walk. Even though in our unbelief, we often think it's a dangerous and risky place. In Christ, we are privileged to be in a safe place. It might not be the nicest place. It might not be the place we want to be. We might want to just deny our responsibilities and just, just leave me alone, God. But it's the safest place to be as, as it was for Esther. And, you know, she, she worried about going into the king's presence. But she followed uh, that fasting and prayer decision to do so. And we see that, don't we? That the safest place to be is in God's will. You know, Satan's, where Satan thought his greatest moment to be was killing the son and the inheritance would be his. That's what he thought he was doing on the cross, killing the Son of God, and the inheritance would be his. His would be the kingdom. His, that darkest moment, and that most dangerous moment became the safest place 
for the Christian, for, the, for God in Christ to be and for the Christian to be. That became uh, the place of his greatest defeat, the birthplace of his ultimate destruction. And to be in Christ is to be in the safest place. And the Esther story does also remind us as we close that his kingdom will come and his enemies will be destroyed. The enemies of truth and of righteousness, uh, the enemies of God will be destroyed because unbelief is culpable, as we saw this morning, and safety and security is only in God's family and in God's home. His kingdom will come. And it doesn't look like that, does it? We are living in days when it doesn't look like his kingdom will come. But it will. And Esther is this orphaned, probably uneducated refugee who was beautiful and was used uh, greatly for her simple faith and allowed God to work great miracles uh, through her. And I believe in the simplicity of our own faith. We can learn from her uh, and also be gloriously used in his kingdom. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, help us to work for you and live for you and love you. And when the crossroads of faith come into our experience, be it today or tomorrow or in the coming days. And we are presented with the opportunity to almost save ourselves or obey the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. May we live and serve for the kingdom and move forward in faith and in prayer uh, to do the simple things that are right and leave the rest up to God. Uh, we thank you that uh, you are a God who condescends to use ordinary people like Esther and like us to fulfill your kingdom's work. And each of us have undoubtedly been brought to the kingdom in Edinburgh at this time for a specific purpose. And may in the ordinariness and sometimes randomness of our lives, may we be able to see that. Wait on you, pray for guidance, and obey you. For Jesus' sake, amen.